Hello, I'm Louisa Burden. I'm the Head of Conservation here at the British Museum. And I'm very happy to welcome you all to the British Museum's Hirayama Studio for the second afternoon of this symposium to celebrate the work of the Memore Pacific Project for the Conservation of Korean Pictorial Art at the British Museum. So we have some technical notes for you before we start. We have live audio interpretation available today. And to listen to this session in Korean, please click on the interpretation button at the bottom of the screen to enable this. To ask a question, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and post your questions. And we will put these to the panel during this Q&A session. Today's talks offer an insight into some of the work carried out to conserve the Korean paintings here at the British Museum, this time a little bit more detail in comparison to our first session. For those of you who are joining us the first time, here's a little bit of information about the project. The project began in 2018 and will finish in March 2023. It has been a collaboration between British Museum conservators curators of East Asian art, and our British Museum scientists, alongside our colleagues in Korea and elsewhere. We are very grateful to our funders, the Amori Pacific Corporation, and the support we have had throughout by the Korea Foundation, the Amori Pacific Museum, and Mrs. Pyun of the Amori, the Amori Pacific Museum Curator. Their thanks, we thank them very, very much for their help. The British Museum has a long history of conservation in East Asian paintings and this project was integrated into the Hirayama studio where this work happens. The Hirayama studio was opened as the only conservation and remounting studio at a European museum that is purely dedicated to East Asian pictorial art. It differs from conservation studios in Asia by not being culturally specific and it is equipped to carry out conservation treatments and mounting in Chinese, Japanese, and now Korean traditions. The international team who work here support each other and learn and respect the differences between each other's approaches and traditions. The British Museum has approximately 550 drawings and paintings in the collection. This project included surveying some of the paintings and this survey helped in the decision making for which paintings to conserve. An early focus of the survey work were the folding screens due to their complexity and the numbers of paintings associated with them. Later in the work program, scroll, mount, scroll paintings were surveyed. We have been especially fortunate to have Korean specialists and experts work with us at the British Museum's Hirayama studio. Expert scroll mounters came from Korea to assist with various discussions and practical work. This assistance was a key part of the project and the preservation of the paintings. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everybody who traveled so far to work with us in London in what at times were difficult circumstances due to the pandemic. Skills and knowledge sharing is a key part of developing conservation practice. And this has been a significant part of this project. A number of seminars were held at the studio and this enabled detailed discussions about approaches for th such things as one of the folding screen conservation projects. Our colleagues come from Korea came to work with us and showed us their skills and the British Museum and team and I are especially, really appreciated the opportunity to see them working and sharing with us their knowledge and experience in this field. Within the project, connections have been made with skilled artisans in Korea, including carpenters, textile dyers and traditional paper makers. And I would like to acknowledge this support and thank them all for their time. A focus seminar on Korean mounting fabrics ensured correct materials were purchased for the conservation treatments here. Finding these skilled artisans and the materials required for the work of the paintings has been vital to ensure the completion of the conservation work. 
Other outward facing work included contributions to conferences and a three day program that focused on discovering Korean art at the British Museum. And this was in collaboration with the Korean Cultural Centre in the UK and our own curatorial colleagues. The project conservators' contributions to this were based at the Hiriyama studio and the delegates joined her here. The project has provided us with small stocks of Korean materials such as silks and papers to support the conservation of these paintings. The project has also enabled the purchase of a Hirox 3D video microscope. This amazing piece of kit has also got a bespoke motorised bridge to aid the examination of paintings which the microscope is attached to so it can run across close to the paintings. This piece of equipment actually took the image that we used for advertising the symposium. So you can see the detail that it can get to. So back to our programme today. We will focus on the conservation of a large 12 panel folding screen, a complex 3D object with multiple paintings. And later in the second presentation, we'll be looking at the scientific investigations into the mounting fabrics and dyes that have been completed to support the conservation work. And as a reminder, please do send in any questions to us in the live, for the live Q&A session. Just put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Our first speaker today is Meijun Kim Marande, the Amore Pacific Conservator for Korean Paintings at the British Museum. She studied art history at Hong Ik University, Seoul, and then an MA in Conservation and Restoration at the, of Cultural Property at the Pantheon Sorbonne University in Paris. In 2018, she received a PhD from Paris Sorbonne University on the mounting of Joseon Dynasty Korean paintings. Mei Jung trained in traditional East Asian methods of conservation and remounting at the Hiriyama studio at the British Museum, first when a student and then as a doctoral fellow. Mei Jung has also completed two 12-month conservative contracts working at the studio here. I hope you enjoy this first presentation. Hello everyone. Today I would like to discuss the conservation and research I have conducted on specific work, namely the five confession rights. At the onset, we planned that the conservation of the skin was to be carried out in cooperation with the Korean visiting conservators. This skin has its 19th century mouth, and thus it is an important example of pre 20th century Korean mounting methods and style. The conservation process revealed important and interesting information with regard to late Joseon screen mountings. In 1797, he illustrated the stories exemplifying five Confucian virtues, or Gyunhik Jildo became a popular book in Korea enriched with the prints and was re-edited and reprinted several times in the 19th century. These illustrations became models and were used by painters to decorate the screens in Korea. The screen, which is the focus of this talk, depicts this particular subject. It probably dates the mid-19th century and was acquired in Korea by the English ambassador S. L. Denning and later bought by the museum from him in 1957. It is a screen made of the 12 panels, each panel illustrating the five confusion virtues. The British Museum screen indeed offers some of the features that seem particular to Korean screen. Its height, for example, are quite important, measuring no less than 1.7 meters, and the number of the panels, 12, is the largest number of the panels used for Korean folding screens. This is the back of the folding screen. On the outside of the first panel, there is, as you shall see, a title tag with the inscription 
illustrated uh, stories exemplifying the five confusion virtues. And as I already said, this screen was uh, in its original state and had never been remounted. It was an example of the original appearance of the screen paintings depicting confusion ideas. There is a very similar example in the Baltimore Museum of Art, but it has been entirely remounted. In the British Museum example, the artist added a landscape to the illustration to fill the composition of each panel. Some of these subjects appear the more ornamental, while certain elements reflect the artist's misunderstanding of the episodes. The dominants use intense colors, including Berminian, Malachite green, synthetic ultramarine, and white, accentuated the ornamental feature of the painting. This screen painting was not only intended to enlighten and educate ordinary people, it was also meant to de uh, decorate a large space. Before explaining what I did, it may be useful to give a few words about the characteristic of a Korean chosen folding screen. The PowerPoint slide that I have prepared illustrates the different stages and structures added to each panel from left to right, as well as their terminology. Firstly, a carpenter was in charge of the manufacturing, the wooden inner letter structure used as a framework, which was the typically made of pine tree. Secondly, the application of lead lacquer on the literal feet of the wooden framework is a very important detail. Unlike the Chinese and Japanese configuration, the phenomenon of visibility of the fit of the skin is a typical Korean element. This discrepancy with respect to the surface of the ground seems to be explained by the underfloor heating system under, which is a therefore probable explanation as to why the fit were a key element to Korean folding skin specifically. Another explanation is that while Japanese folding screens are mainly used indoors, Korean folding screens are often also installed and used outdoors. Thus, the fit stabilize the folding screen on the uneven ground and keep it from the getting dirty. This fit, which were not added to the structure of the inner lattice framework, was nothing more than the extension of the vertical out Bar. The second panel on this slide illustrates the underpapering process. The underpapering on the inner the, the frame wooden structure was made of the recycled paper. Traditionally, several different types of the documents were used for the underpapering with interesting documents such as unused recycled papers from candidates who had failed government exams. After the underpapering process for each panel, the panels were all unified using paper hinges. These hinges were also made of recycled paper, which were attached with the paste. The quality of the paper used for the underpapering is much more resistant which allows the hinges to ensure a secure connection between panels. After connecting the hinges, another layer of the underpapering was added. Then the painting was attached onto the underpapered panel. We then apply the dark blue cover stick on the both external panels of the screen, the first and the last one as well as outer sides of each individual panel, which would be in contact with the outside when closed. In terms of the painting, for the first line people of the painting, the Korean Joseon mounter usually use Chinese paper known for its short fibers, while the second lining was made using Korean mulberry paper hanji. Then, both the uh, top and the bottom parts of the panels were decorated with uh, silk mounts. 
as well as this the mounter that attached the small decorative the copper bands all around its panel. The role of this was to be decorative, but another advantage was also that the thickness around the, the actual painting would be thicker, thus protecting it from the, any surface abrasion by direct contact with the painting on the opposite face when closed, which were open the areas which were most damaged. We also inserted a white narrow strips and a red one on either side of the small decorative purple bands. Now, I'd like to discuss the morphological characteristic of the Orient Hengshil Do screen. It is worth pointing out here that the metal fittings are rarely found on the first and last panels on Korean screens, and thus very interesting. They were obviously added to protect the entire folding screen structure from the shock when closed, while also constituting nice decorative elements. Through these uh, details, one can clearly see the top and bottom mounts decorated with the silk. I was able to identify the satin damask motif as being called the eight immortals and thin clouds. This type of silk variety is associated with the scholar officer families, Yang Ban, who had known to have lived in the area of Andong, a city north of the Gyeongju in the southeast during the 19th century. As you shall see in this example, also a white and rather narrow strip was added between the utmost part of the decorative silk at both the top and the bottom, nearly to the painting. These were uniquely decorative, especially when assembled with the metal fittings. I would now like to briefly present the condition of this screen. When first examined, it has found in extremely bad condition. Due to its fragility, the screen could not be handled easily, and we noticed that all the silk could be very easily damaged. There was a severe physical damage, such as tearing, as well as a general discoloration in most areas. There was a lot of dust everywhere on the screen, the mount silk were also powdery and fragile. Apart from this, accretion, dot, and deposit were found all over the surface of the painting. In the parts which had extremely tearing, we noticed that there had been the two previous repairs, one being the relative lesson and the other having been made at the most earlier stage. The letter appears to be an attempt to fix a hole made due to a fire while the other attempt on a tear. Mrs. Bak ji of a Zhongzhi Conservation Studio are her former student, Mrs. jo now conservator at the National Archives of the Korea, were inverted the British Museum for two days in 2019 and for one week in 2022 to collaborate on the conservation treatment of remounting of the five lights. Mrs. Bach and I discuss the characteristic of the condition of the screen and the plan the treatment. Thanks to her, we were able to develop our ideas and she generously shared her experience for this project. Her advice on mounting thoroughly helped us in our next steps, after which I had to undertake the rest of the conservation aspect. After the examination, treatment plans and schedule were dropped for this screen, 
since securing appropriate Korean silk was challenging, was we wished to retain the original historical material as much as possible. We decided to reuse some of the original mount silk. I have disassembled the skin by removing the painting from inner the framework and the mounting after consolidating the unstable pigmented areas. After a capillary washing, the old lining papers were carefully removed and after they were completely repaired, all table paintings were lined again with the dyed Chinese stamp paper and the Korean marble paper hanji. After the removal of its old lining paper of mount silk, I repaired and lined the mount silk twice as well as the decorative the bands with the help of the, my Hiram Studio colleagues Kyoko Kusunaki and Matthias Satyas. Before the assembling the process, all paintings and the mount silk which were lined were stretched on the drying board. Now, I would like to discuss my observation in detail during this uh, conservation operation. During the drying cleans process, we removed the black powder, the first removal of the painting's surface, and the surrounding fabrics was uh, carried out using a soft brush and the conservation vacuum cleaner, which absorbed all this uh, fabric which had become a powder due to extreme damage. Once using a microscope, we were able to identify that this powder was actually the original fabric, which made me realize the severity of the Mount Silk state. As you can see in these photos, there is a large difference between the exposed silk and the silk that had been covered under the old mount elements. Due to our the decision of reusing the original silk, it was crucial to find a solution to consolidate this damaged silk, which had become a powder, illustrating the, its extreme death fragility. During the annual autumn 2019 workshop seminar focusing on Korean mounting fabrics, I tested the consolidation the fragile silk with the fibrins proteins and the EGDE with the Dr. Zvoyung Lee, a scientist who was invited to the seminar. We did not have enough time to test these products sufficiently, but this would be a very good subject for future scientific research. Some pigments uh, were also found to be extremely fragile, and the dominance used intense colors including Armenians, malachite greens, synthetic ultramarine in white, were uh, weakened over time. I therefore use a rabbit plume and the progress blaze that increased the percentage from 1 to 3. From the end of the 19th century, Korean painters are known to have started using synthetic pigments. The problem is that we do not yet know how to consolidate this kind of synthetic pigments. I have used a museum standard consolidation method applied to Eastern Asian paintings, relies on the using animal glue, as I just mentioned. Obviously, I could have used a synthetic consolidant, but since this had not been tested, and we were unaware of its effect in the long term, I believed it would be too risky to use this in this case. After applying uh, several times this uh, animal glue, some parts, especially the uh, blue, were still very sensitive. Once uh, having finished this uh, process, I let the painting dry for at least uh, three days uh, before baking remover. Paint 
translate, by removing the original second line in paper, we found some official documents which contained the name of a location in Korea, named Muncheongun Hamgyeongdo, currently is a part of North Korea. It was all about the number of inhabitants in this area, similar to doomsday books made in English in the 11th century. It is known that these documents were surveys made in Korea every three years, after which they were disposed of. And so these official documents from the over 70 sheets that had been recycled. Thanks to this, we were able to identify the location of where the screen must have been made. As I mentioned previously, the painting pigments were so fragile that when removing the first line of papers, I had to minimize the use of waters. Despite the several methods of the removing the first line of papers in Asia, I found that I had to devise a new method which would be most suited to fragile pigments of these paintings. After testing these uh, techniques on the first painting, I noticed that after seven hours since removing the first lining paper from the primary support, some pigment particles start removing. I also realized that it was important to not to use any techniques involving pressure, even if it was minimal. As it was a scotch dispigmented area. By using a polyester sheet, I have removed the, all the first line papers little by little using tweezers as seen on this video. It was uh, crucial to finish this uh, operation for each painting in the space of seven hours. As soon as uh, I had to completed this operation. I immediately have to line the painting with the Chinese the sham paper. Therefore, to remove the first old lining papers, it took a very intense day of work to complete just one, including stabilizing the, with the paste state after lining it with the sham paper. On the 10th panel, we found traces of previous treatments and more specifically on area which had been infilled and then repainted, as well as this all around the, the area that had been infilled, there was traces of overpainting. We then found that some parts of the inner frame had completely disappeared due to combustion. And as you can see on this picture, the wood had been carbonated. With the techniques and the pigments used for the overpainting, one could guess that it was a professional who was very familiar with the painting, thus the painting having probably been restored locally. At a certain point, the painting must have been burned during an accident, revealing that the use of this skin must have been specifically for decorative purposes, due to the fact that such a damage could only have been created if a candle had stayed there for a long time, which was likely to have happened during the some type of ceremony. We also noticed that the area that had been uh, infilled was only a small section of silk that had been attached on the back, after which someone had repainted over it from the front. I then separated this part that had been repainted and removed all the under papers and the lining papers after which I infilled this area again, reused the small sections of silk 
that had been repainted and then readjusted its position and then lined the painting again. This discovery was uh, rather interesting as this led us to gain a better understanding of how paintings were restored and cared for at the time, as well as allowing us to comprehend the purposes that these kinds of schemes. At first, I wished to reuse the paper applied on the back of the panels in order to retain the original materials, but I soon found that this was oiled paper and that due to this paper, some acidity was spreading into the rest of the papers. And I therefore concluded that it would be better to not reuse this paper. I have therefore used a matching modern Korean paper to back the screen panels. During my field work in Korea in November and December 2019 and in April 2022, I bought several materials from different kinds of artisans and experts. Firstly, I asked a carpenter, Mr. Kim Mung Won, to make a wooden lattice framework in advance. I also purchased antique silk for infilling the missing areas and the mountain silk in Seoul. I also commissioned the metal fittings from a maker of metals ornates, Mr. Kim Gilbong. Finally, it was also necessary to purchase some mount silk, after which I have asked for them to be dyed by a dyer, Miss Lee Jong Nam, to a suitable color for the screen. While doing some my field work in Korea, I have also carried out under papering on the wooden inner frames at the Jongje studio located in Seoul because I needed the help of a carpenter to trim the wooden framework, which would not have been possible to achieve in London. Later in London, this screen was remounted onto the inner frame with as many of the original parts retained as possible such as the mount silk and the metal fittings. In 2022, Mrs. Bak Ji-sun and Joone were invited again to British Museum for one week to collaborate on the mount assembly. Once having completed this, I had attached the metal fittings onto the frame. During the conservation process, it was important for me to be able to retain the ancient mounting techniques and in order to do this, I had made the digital image works, which had a good way to record the mounting process and techniques. When demounting, I have removed each layer in the reverse order that the original screen mounter had mounted the painting to understand that the order of each step and the way in which each layer was uh, added. This following slide is, I will show you the before and after treatment of the screen from uh, both the front and the back. This screen now welcomes the visitors going up the north stairs to the Korean gallery. We hope that this impressive decorative skin will play a large role in attracting visitors who wish to learn more about Korea's art, history, and traditions. Before finishing this talk, I wish to thank Mrs. Park ji Mr. Jo Ne, my Hiram Studios colleagues and Kyoko Kusunoki and Matthias Sotias, as well as all the specialists, artisan and all those involved in this project. As this would never have been possible to be completed without their expertise and help. I would also like to thank Elinor Hyun for initiating this Our Pacific project. 
Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Mijun. Our second speaker today is Diego Tamburini. Diego is an analytical chemist with a PhD in the use of chromatographic and mass spectrometric techniques for the characterization of organic materials. He joined the British Museum in 2016 as an Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral fellowship, focusing on the dianalysis of historical and archeological textiles. In 2020, Diego moved to the National Museum of Asian Art at the Smithsonian, as, as a Smithsonian postdoctoral fellow. In 2021, Diego returned to the British Museum in his current role as a scientist of polymeric and modern organic materials and has worked on a wide range of Asian textiles. I hope you enjoy this presentation. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Diego Tamborini, and I'm one of the scientists in the Department of Scientific Research at the British Museum. And my presentation deals with the scientific investigation of some of the mountain elements of some of the Korean paintings that were conserved in the framework of the Amore Pacific um, project. And the investigation mostly dealt with um, dye analysis. So I assume that you have already heard by now about the paintings themselves. And so I'm, I'm gonna go straight into the dye world, starting with uh, natural dyes. So natural dyes are substances that can be extracted from a huge variety of plants but also some animals, for example, some, some insects and also some mollusks. And they have been used for millennia by people to uh, dye textiles, for example. Um, the, the variety of natural dyes is as big as uh, the world's biodiversity. And uh, people have drawn from local sources of dyes, but then they also have imported other ones. And so it's a, it's a very complicated world, which gets even more complicated in the second half of the 19th century when synthetic dyes were uh, invented. It actually happened by chance, but in the second half of the 19th century, in about 50 years, this was uh, a major research line that drove uh, research in organic chemistry, but even the industrial revolution itself. And the result is that by the end of the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century, there were so many formulations of synthetic dyes and they were all given very different names. Manufacturers were competing with each other. And for a certain amount of time, they really replaced natural dyes on the market. Um, this makes investigation into dyes in general very, very difficult and challenging from a scientific point of view, because the numbers of possibilities that we are dealing with is uh, very, very high. But um, at the British Museum, we have been working on these uh, for a while, and we now have a sort of analytical protocol in place. And without going into any details, the, the, uh, this analytical protocol is divided in two. We have a first uh, part of the investigation where we tend to use uh, non-invasive uh, techniques. And by non-invasive, uh, I mean that we do not require to take a sample, so not to uh, damage the object in uh, any way. Um, in this part of the investigation, we tend to use techniques that mostly interact with light and with some, some parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And some dyes can already be identified at this stage. But it is, it is actually a little more common to require additional information to uh, provide a precise identification. So what we tend to do is to use the data uh, 
um, acquired non-invasively to actually decide um, a sampling strategy, uh, minimizing the number and the size of the samples that we take from uh, specific areas. And once the sample are taken, we go into the invasive part of the protocol, but we can access much more powerful analytical techniques. And these techniques can allow the identification of the dyes down to the molecular level, which means that we can really identify the species of the plant that was used to extract a natural dye, for example, or really distinguish the precise synthetic dye that uh, was used. But ultimately, I just want to say a few words about why, why doing um, dye analysis? What, uh, what is the information that can actually be obtained? But, well, of course, we uh, can get information about uh, the object itself and how it was manufactured. But um, dyes are quite um, powerful um, little tools, if you want, because we, we can actually refine uh, the provenance of a textile, because we know that certain dyes were specific to certain geographical regions or that they started to be traded uh, at a certain time. So basically, when a certain dye is found on a textile that doesn't necessarily belong to that geographical region, we can establish um, trading routes between people or connections between people. And we can also refine uh, the dating of the textile, which is something quite difficult to do in general. But again, we know that certain dyes were used after or before a certain time period. This is particularly true for the synthetic dyes, of course. And in that case, we can really uh, go down to the specific year because we know the the year of the first synthesis of um, synthetic dyes. But then um, knowing the information about the light sensitivity of the dyes and how they degrade can also inform about the original color that the textiles um, look like and we can reconstruct their original appearance. And this is important not only to um, reconstruct the original intention of the artwork, but also to uh, decide around display strategy and how safe and for how long certain textiles can be exhibited. So now I'm gonna go through the results of the investigation uh, and I'm gonna talk about three paintings. Uh, the first one is um, an 18th century, late 18th century uh, portrait that you, you will probably have already seen by now. So I'm gonna go um, into um, some details of the mounting elements. So um, the areas of interest here were um, the, the textile border, which has a light blue color on the front and a dark blue color uh, on the back. There is then um, the hanging element, which has um, um, a string with finishes with, with a tassel, and it's a, um, a dark red, uh, orangey color. And then the hanging rod is the edge of the, of the hanging rod also has a textile element, which has a, a bright red um, color. So, um, as I said, we, st we start this type of investigation non-invasively, and this is an example of what um, some non-invasive results look like. These um, curves that you see here are obtained by a technique which is called fiber optic reflectance spectroscopy. And um, the little bumps and, and uh, peaks in these curves can be indicative of specific materials. So at the top, you can see the result from the two textile borders, the light blue and the dark blue. And these, um, this shape is actually typical of um, indigo, indigo blue dye, which um, is so, um, suggested to be present in both the front and the back of this textile. And in the bottom part, we have the result on the left for the tassel and on the right for the hanging rod. 
So about the tassel, it's it's actually a very um, a difficult interpret interpretation to make. It, it can point a little bit towards the presence of sapan wood as a possible source of red, but there is also something indicating uh, that something yellow is also present here, but um, nothing that can uh, lead to a, um, to a hypothetical identification. Whereas for the hanging rod, that, that, that quite sharp peak is quite um, indicative of the presence of a flower. This non-invasive investigation for this specific painting uh, has been published in, a, in an article, and here are um, the details of the article, which also, also includes information about other uh, textile borders from other types of um, Asian paintings. So have a look if you are curious. But in the framework of uh, the investigation that I am uh, that I want to talk about now, we were able to take some samples and so to access the um, the invasive part of the protocol. And here is a little video that shows an example of um, a little sample taken from the tassel to give you an idea of how this happens, how minimal the uh, damage is. And this is another video where uh, the um, situation is more complex because here I'm trying to peel off a few silk fibers from the, um, the textile board uh, on the front. And I think you saw some of, of the fibers coming off and here I'm putting them on the, on the glass slide and here are some of the results. So here you can see the same uh, small sample um, under, under a microscope. You can see how um, little the, the, the fibers are and, are and just a few of them, but this little amount of sample was um, enough to obtain information by using um, another technique, which is called high pressure liquid chromatography. And the little graph that you see at the bottom is what we call uh, a chromatogram. And the little peak that I indicated, which uh, is also, um, which, which has a, a word, indigotin, indicates that there is a molecule in, in here. And this, mo this molecule is indeed indigotin. And this is the marker molecule for indigo, which was therefore, therefore confirmed as the dye used both to obtain the light blue color on the front and the dark blue color on the back. And the difference is very uh, probably in the number of dye baths that were used. So uh, possibly using just one indigo dye bath generally gives a very light blue color and then increasing the number of dye baths increases the shade of blue that is obtained. Here is the result from the tassel. Um, the, the chromatogram showed and confirmed the presence of sapan wood, which uh, is a red dye that is extracted from the heartwood of a tree. And it's, it's a typical uh, red dye in East Asia and in Asia more in general that has been used for century. But the the invasive investigation also enabled to uh, confirm the fact that there was indeed a yellow dye as well. And this yellow dye is extracted from the bark of another tree, which is called the Chinese cork tree. And uh, it is another very typical Asian dye that has been used for millennia. It has, it has been found on uh, Chinese textiles from the BC time and um, so very, very, very um, traditional and as I said, used for a lot of time. And then finally from, from the hanging rod, we got confirmation from uh, the safflower, in safflower red, which is uh, extracted from the petals of the safflower flower. Again, a very uh, typical dye uh, used in Asia, but also in other parts of the world. So ultimately the results confirmed that um, this, um, these textile borders are uh, probably original and contemporaneous with the painting. They are all natural. So probably this, this has um, 
probably happened, of course, before the, the, the invention of synthetic dyes. The other interesting aspect about these results is that they are they not only inform potentially on the on the object that we investigated on the painting at the British Museum, but there are other examples of very very similar portraits in other museums, and uh, the mount, the mounting elements look uh, exactly the same, and so these results can potentially be extended to other. Um, objects uh, increasing their uh, their value. Moving on to the second painting, uh, this is um, a two panel folding screen. Um, and here the mounting elements that we focused on are all um, textile elements, textile uh, border. There is a purple brocade that is exposed in the middle part of the in the join between the two panels you can already see a, a very neat difference in color between um, the exposed part and this bright part at the bottom that was actually covered and then revealed um, because of some damage you can see how purple that part is and then there is some uh, brown um, elements, uh, a little pink stripe, and then a blue um, border that, um, that is in the bottom part of, of, of the painting. So starting with the purple, this is a nice image obtained by digital microscopy that was taken once the brown uh, stripe covering the purple damask was, remo was removed. So here it shows even better the level of discoloration that this purple dye um, had, had uh, undergone. And this is um, a higher magnification image, again, of that um, um, border between the, the, the discoloration, the disc discolored area and the uh, non-discolored area. And he, here, it's just to show how high magnification we can go with digital microscopy, we can measure fibers, and uh, we can also take little videos that show uh, really the three-dimensionality di three of um, textile and details of the weaving and so forth. But going, going um, again in the detail of the dye, the non-invasive investigation here was a little tricky. It pointed towards a synthetic purple, probably of the methyl violet family, but it was only with the um, high pressure liquid chromatography, HPLC analysis that we got confirmation about that. So this is indeed a methyl violet, but the details of the molecule, and this is the only molecule I am gonna show, enabled us to identify exactly the type of dye. And this is a methyl violet 3B, which was discovered in 1866. So moving on to the blue border, again, this is a nice image showing the various level of discolorations. The bottom part even shows the imprint of the purple damask that was on top. The middle part shows the color as, as it probably was before, before this coloring and fading, which is the color that actually appears uh, in, the, in the top part. And this is, again, a, another close-up showing that edge, well, that, yeah, that border between the two, the two areas. Um, Again, non-invasive investigation already pointing towards this being a synthetic blue, but which exactly uh, difficult to say. We took a sample and I hope you can see a little bit again, the, the, how little the sample is. And this was more than enough to get signals out of it and identify the molecules. And this is uh, a methyl blue an aniline blue, uh, precisely discovered in 1862. And some methyl violet was also detected because as you saw, there was some transfer of the dye. And so having the visual information 
made us um, have the right uh, interpretation about this just being contamination from another textile. Mo moving on to the pink, again, quite difficult to say non-invasively, um, it points towards the possible presence of fuchsin, another synthetic dye, but it's, it's not a perfect match if you want. So again, a little sample was taken, and this is a night nice image of the of the of, of the elements once they were taking off the, the the painting. And again, the sample, a nice image of the sample, and a chromatogram confirming the presence of fuchsin. And even in this case, the molecular detail enabled us to understand that it was not only fuchsin, but was also fuchsin obtained with a precise um, synthetic process that was the, the first one. So this is a very early example of fuchsin, which was discovered in 1856. And finally, with the brown color, we got, again, difficult information from the non-invasive um, investigation. We took a sample, and here we found a mixture of dyes. We found fuchsin again, and then we found, uh, we found evidence of sapon wood, but the only molecule for sapon wood that was identified was a degradation product. Now, sapon wood um, discolors into brown shades. And so it, um, it actually makes sense that this is likely um, um, a discolored textile again, dyed with a mixture of fuchsin and sapon wood. And so, we can say with quite enough confidence that this was originally much more um, pinkish and, and reddish than uh, it appears today. And the third uh, painting is this 12 panel folding screen. And it's again, um, late 19th century in, in date. Uh, and these are the, mounts, the mountain elements that we took into consideration already separated from the painting. So there is uh, some blue, uh, a blue cotton textile that actually surrounded the wooden frame. Uh, there is a brown um, textile and there is again a, a blue one silk textile which shows some discoloration. And then there was, a, there was some uh, pinkish reddish color, uh, again, as, as, a, as, a, as a thin stripe uh, that I'm gonna show some um, close up images uh, in, a, in a second. Um, the blue cotton textile was found to be dyed with indigo again, so with a natural dye confirmed by uh, molecular analysis. And here is also a nice example of uh, the microscopy enable to say, enabling to say that um, this fabric was dyed uh, already as a fabric. You can see the, the white uh, marks that indicate that the dye could not penetrate because it was already woven, the textile was already woven. And about the blue silk, uh, as I said, it showed this uh, discoloration already pointing towards uh, a synthetic dye already from the non-invasive investigation. Um, again, sampling performed and the same methyl blue dye that was found on the other painting was also found um, here. Uh, finally, the brown silk, was actually found to be a mixture of dyes again, but in this case, we have again, indication of fuchsin and also again from this early process, but in this case was mixed with uh, tannins. Tannins are um, actually a class of materials that cannot, um, it's very difficult to uh, link to an exact source because they can be extracted from a lot, a lot of plants, but they are generally natural materials and they were used uh, to obtain uh, generally darker, dark shades of um, color. And finally, here is where I think you can, you can see this uh, pinkish reddish color that I was referring um, to before. Uh, Non-invasive investigation, very challenging. These curves here are, are not very uh, informative. 
And then again, the molecular analysis gave us the, um, the answer. And here we are in front of a red synthetic dye, slightly later, it's called benzopurpurine, and it was synthesized in uh, 1884. So just giving a little summary, um, we could, the dye analysis informed us that um, the first painting, the portrait, was dyed exclusively with natural dyes, and these were all belong to um, to the Asian tradition, I would, I'm tempted to say Chinese tradition, but uh, chi China and Korea share a lot of uh, dyes in common, of course, but very traditional recipes, even the mixture of sapan wood and Chinese cork tree is found uh, in, in, um, in dyeing recipes. And then we have the, the later, the later paintings, late 19th century, uh, again confirmed, for the first one, however, I just would like to, to, to say a few words, a um, few additional words about these, um, the fact that all these dyes were very, very early. Methyl blue, methyl violet, and fuchsin were really among the first ones to be um, um, commercialized. And these, together with the fact that there is this very nice example of fuchsin, so a synthetic dye mixed with sapan wood, which is a natural dye, I think that points towards the fact that um, these textiles were actually dyed in that um, phase, in early phase, if you want, where these synthetic dyes were starting to reach uh, Asia from Europe, and, and these master dyers were probably experimenting a little bit, and in some cases, uh, maybe did not really like the, the shade of color that they were getting. And so they were still going back to what they actually knew, meaning the, the natural dyes, and try these interesting mixtures that then are very, very rarely found in, in, in later textiles. Um, the, the, the third uh, painting instead, the 12th uh, panel screen, is potentially a little later. Instead, the benzopurpurin, as I said, is, is a slightly later dye. And the mixture of fuchsin and tannins is actually something that is reported, for example, in, in, in dyeing manuals from the 1890s as well. So despite the fact that tannins are natural dyes, they, they, they kept being mixed just to darken the color of um, of other dyes, and in this case, synthetic dyes, even later on. So here is where I, I'm going to conclude my, my presentation by thanking uh, my colleagues and also, of course, um, you for, for your attention. And yeah, thank you very much. Well, those were a fascinating talk there by Diego, and I'm really looking forward to um, lots more questions coming in. We have some to start, and I'm joined now by Mei Zhong and Diego for this afternoon, and I'm going to share the questions between you so that there is always <laughs> someone thinking about something. So we have a question from Sarah Scaturo. Um, she's interested in the fibrolin in consolidation testing. What was the additional chemical that was tested alongside it? And why was this method not used? Uh, is that for consolidation pigments area? Uh, uh, as I uh, mentioned in the talk, uh, traditionally we used to use always uh, animal glue for no, consolidation. I think they're asking the consolidation of the silk, of the silk, fiber. A yeah. fiber. Fiber. Fibrin, the one you did with uh, Boyong. Yeah, okay. I'm so, <laughs> probably <yeah. laughs> a little misunderstanding uh, <laughs> regarding uh, the consolidation. Uh, the, this one is uh, just uh, we initiate the test, uh, so we can't give uh, too much information. Uh, uh, I found that this uh, consolidant uh, developed uh, originally the uh, China and uh, Hangzhou. Uh, Silk Museum, they developed 
but they say this moment uh, when I discovered that this information, probably say we can apply the for Mount Silk also. So we start with and this uh, thanks to thanks uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Boyong's uh, knowledge regarding the uh, old fibroin. So she gave uh, another information. Probably see in the future we can give a uh, more detailed information. Thank you. And this, I think uh, Boyong she can uh, explain the, in the future more detail and the very interesting the discovery. Thank you very much. So for Diego, a question for you. If the colours are completely faded, for example, pink turned to brown completely, is it still possible to distinguish it as a pink dye from the fragment signals? Yes, yes, not, not always, but I would say in a, in a, in a good percentage of cases, the, the dye um, degrade, and so from a molecular point of view, they, they degrade into other molecules, even if they become colorless, uh, the technique that we have here available, um, LCMS, still enables to identify those molecules. And so with, with, with the right background information, we are able to link the degradation products back to the original dye source. Then, of course, when, when the reconstructing the exact intended shade of the color is, is another story because with the same dye you can actually dye um, a different diff a range of shades so that that's always a little bit of an assumption unless you are you have these lucky scenarios when you have these hidden parts of the textile where what the, the, the color is preserved and then you have this visual uh, confirmation of, of the, the original color. But yes, when, when the dyes degrade, they can still be identified at a molecular level. As I said, not always, always, but in, in a good amount of cases, yeah. Thank you. Um, for Mejung, could you tell us about the Korean traditional storage for screens? Uh, would you use such things as wooden boxes or silk wrappers? And what do we do at the British Museum? Oh, <laughs> this uh, question is uh, quite tricky. Uh, in Korean daily life, uh, when we used to use a uh, folding screen for ceremony, uh, we used to use a quilted cloth, the mm -hmm. covered. And uh, for conservation point of view, now uh, uh, my colleague, Korean colleagues, it's a different studio. They are de developing different design. It's a one is a much more keeping traditional uh, split, using quilted uh, or very gorgeous uh, silk to cover. And another studio they are uh, redesigned to adopt this uh, folding screen uh, format. So it's uh, with the uh, Western medium standard uh, board. They used to use uh, corrugated, especially corrugated board. They used to use. Thank you. So there is variation depending on yeah. on on who is developing the screens for um, yes. the screen protection. Yes. Depending on wh where we are in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So for Diego, what was the nature of the silk dust? And could it be detrimental to the silk of the painting? Is the silk degradation resulting in silk becoming so brittle, partly to do with the dyeing process, and not just exposure to light and air? Yeah, it's well, it's 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 an interesting question. There are um, there is some research on well about the dust. I'm not I'm not super sure about. I think that that's quite a common, you know, and we didn't investigate the the dust we assumed it was you know p part of the mm -hmm. of the of, of the aging process of the of the but the exposure to to environment and 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 so forth but um about the fact that the dye can uh induce some degradation into into the fibers there is of course some research there are some dyeing processes that we know are very detrimental uh, of course the 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 iron and tannins for example it's it's quite uh a known case with these particular dyes, I, I haven't come across to, um, to to any research done on the the, the chemical dyes, the synthetic dyes. Um, 
I, in terms of um, the way they are applied to the, to the text, uh, they're actually uh, easier than the natural dyes. They usually do not require more than, for example. So they, should, they shouldn't necessarily, uh, from a chemical point of view at least, induce um, a particular degradation. But it's always uh, a complicated system when you have multiple materials interacting together and with, with, with external factors. So it's definitely an area, an area of research was worth investigating more. But I wouldn't say that the dyes that we found on these textiles in particular uh, represented um, a particular hazard for the textiles. Thank you. So Meijing, did you find any mechanical strength difference between the covered and uncovered area of the mounting silks? Um, was the covered area more stable than the covered area or was it just the colour difference that was there? Yes, the colour difference. Uh, uh, for example, the joining point uh, part area, in the case of the hanging scroll, scroll painting, all scroll from art is really sensitive because uh, the areas that join the piece of another piece is it can create a more tension. Mm -hmm. So it's a very dangerous. But in the case of the screen, uh, the one who severs the panel can stretch all pieces uh, uh, stably on the panel. So everything is uh, quite stable. It's so we less risk uh, the cause the tension between the covers the, uh, on others, uh, the pieces. Did you find when you revealed yeah. from the, the, the mounts that were in front, so you had, you had the two very different colours, was the silk that had been covered stronger than the silk that hadn't been covered? Yes, it's a colour is a completely different uh, because of the, the mainly is, uh, light mm -hmm. and there's some uh, pollution. So it's uh, underneath another mount of elements, much more protected. Mm -hmm. And another area is uh, exposed and many uh, factors that uh, can be damaged. The, this uh, kind of the very sensitive organic material, mm -hmm. silk. Thank you. So Diego, can you contextualize the, the results on the synthetic dyes into the bigger picture of the introduction of these materials from Europe into Asia in the 19th century? Yeah, well, it's, of course, it's a, it's a very big question, but uh, I feel like the, the contextualization is exactly, you know, what, I, I would say doing this type of research in a, in a context such as, such as the British Museum is, is is a very lucky um, thing to do because we, we, we can look a little bit into the, the bigger picture. The collection allows us to uh, broaden and investigate more. So it's, it's of course very difficult to, to, to track, to trace the history of how the synthetic dyes that were indeed discovered in Europe then were exported into Asia. But there is some research, some, some literature available on the topic. It, it's very fragmentary at the moment, but I have myself uh, worked on different parts of um, Asia, all on 19th second half of the 19th century textile, for example, uh, Central Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, there is uh, information on Japan. It, as I said, it's still, I think, early stage to draw a picture, but it's definitely uh, starts, it, it definitely starts to take shape and you can see that there are definitely certain dyes that uh, arrived uh, very early, soon after their discovery. The, the violets, the, the purples, the fuchsia, all those um, colors that were immediately um, thrown to the market for, and, and the fashion be, went crazy for, for these colors also appealed to, to Asia quite quickly. There are other colors that remained uh, much more traditional for, for a longer time. For example, in, in my work on Central Asian textiles, I saw that uh, the yellows and the reds kept being natural uh, while the synthetic greens and purples, for example, had already been introduced. So it also looks like uh, it, th these dyers went through this, I think, you know, uh, experiment, experimentation phase where they were 
trying to use this newly available material, but they were still asked to uh, produce those specific colors for the market. And some, sometimes these dyes simply did, didn't work or didn't produce that specific shade. They were mixing with the natural dyes still. I think that example that I showed of the fuchsin and the sapan wood mixed together exactly shows these moment in time where these people were were trying to integrate new things with, with things that they have known for for century. And so I think there are differences, but uh, as I said, it's 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 something that I'm 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 very interested in and other people are working on the same topic. So I hope in a few years we will have this this bigger picture. It has to be mixed with uh, archival research as well because of course the trading of these materials is also documented in, in, in archives and we do have in the UK and in, in other parts of, of, of the world very strong ar archives that could help this type of research too. So it's not just uh, a scientific uh, endeavor but as always it's, I think it's a multidisciplinary question to tackle from different angles but yeah. Absolutely fascinating. I'm always interested in our uh, dyeing and that, that changeover yeah. from, from natural to synthetic. Absolutely. It's remarkable. So a completely different subject for you, Meijung, this time. Is, is the structure of the original inner wooden lattice different to a modern one in the materials, the joints, the methods? It's uh, quite different uh, because, uh, as uh, I showed in the, my talk, uh, traditionals, uh, the form is much more simple. For example, it's uh, inner, the, the framework, outer and center, uh, and the uh, horizontal is uh, two or three. It depends on the size. Quite simple form, and it's made in a uh, pine tree. But uh, nowadays, uh, we inserted a uh, more baguette Ma, ma, pa inside, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then said the material is a, a pine tree or is a, another is a, uh, the tree also we use, but it depends on the uh, conservation studio. They got quite changed, okay. so I can't define the, just a one the kind of the material the tree, uh, wood we just use. Now they uh, from the, their experience. Of course, a pine tree is a advantage, disadvantage, but it's a surface that can, we can use also advantage, disadvantage. So, for example, outer is the foam, something is a much more uh, rigid, strong, shape, keeping, and the inner is a something that lighter is, uh, the characteristic the wood we used to use. So sometimes the same, sometimes different uh, wood can use also for conservation point of view. Thank you very much. So we have a question from Jennifer Perry. Diego, dye analysis helps us date the mounting textiles, but how can we be certain the silks in a scroll mounting are original, as in original? As for the pair of portraits, are there other clues that help determine this? Yeah, it's, it's, I would say it's a question more for Mijong than for me, but yes, I realized that I, I said um, that the, the results pointed towards the, the mounting being original. It's, it's, it's not um, true um, and it's, it, uh, it of course it can point towards um, the text as being contemporaneous with the paintings, considering that the paintings are usually dated. But of course, it, it is a, um, a traditional uh, practice to replace the textile borders. And this has happened in, in history as well. So we, we do not have, um, if, if we do not have a written record of how many times, we, we cannot be certain. So I don't know if, Mijong, if when you took the, the, the elements off, if you could see some evidence that those were the original or how from a visual point of view. I've worked on tankas, for example, and I remember in that case you can see that the, if there is some a single um, 
how do you say, the sewing holes mm -hmm. um, to attach the textiles. It's true that they can be reused, but visually you can, you, can, you can have a sense whether they have been used just once, and in that case you can assume that that, that, that is the original. I don't know if it, I don't, here it's glued, so it's not sewed, so I don't, I don't know if I, I'll pass it to you. Oh, so, uh, in my uh, study case, we can find some repairs uh, the area that we can find, obviously, visually, so we can find, and uh, th in this case, uh, I can uh, examine more uh, how much it influences the original mount or is that the material we can identify, and then to support my suspect, <laughs> I can develop with these lining papers that discover the original state or not. And this, uh, I couldn't develop much more. The another is the previous treatment for this folding screen. I found some treatment by Japanese technique. Very interesting, but I don't know how the, uh, they attach, they insert this kind of the Japanese uh, strip. What Kyoko is you remember? <laughs> the kind of the other slip we found to repair. So obviously, so we can find some trace of the uh, the repair, but it's a uh, original condition that we can see with uh, another pieces mm -hmm. comparison so I can support much more so my is uh, focus on the original one or not so do this yes but I would say to, to clarify a bit more about the dyes I would say that with, with the dye analysis itself you definitely cannot say whether the textile is is original. What, what what you can say is if it's not though, because for example, if I had found a dye that was produced in in the twentieth century, uh, then I could have quite quite confidently said that the textile was was a later addition. In this case, what we found was that the date of all the dyes, at least the production date of, the, of all the dyes, they could have been applied later, of mm. course, but they also did not stay on the market forever, so they were replaced. So we would, I would say that the window of application of those dyes is pretty much consistent with the dating of the painting. But yeah, ultimately it's not a straightforward uh, original identification from the dye, so it has to be supported by, by other evidence. I think that that's one of the wonderful things about being able to work together, yeah, isn't it? Is finding all these pieces yeah. of evidence to, yes. to help, help all our colleagues find out more about these paintings. So I have a question for Amejian. Um, do you recommend inserting some archival interleaving in between each panel when it's folded, I'm assuming? So when you fold the screens back down, do you put anything in between to protect the paintings? Oh, it's uh, after the treatment. After yeah. treatment, yeah. Uh, it depends. Uh, in general, so we don't insert uh, some uh, uh, the additional the sheet between the panel, but uh, during the treatment, uh, I insert to protect because the painting itself still is not uh, the stable condition. But it's, uh, if you're worried, <laughs> worried that if uh, after the founding so some painting is in a very good condition, I think uh, I recommend insert this kind of thing. The, uh, if we can see the, in detail the structure and the thickness of the part, the outer the decorative band can give us some thickness to protect the painting uh, 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 with a direct contact opposite side uh, of the painting normally uh, systematically so we can do but it's a really damaged uh, case the shape is not straight away so it's in this case it's better is a uh, medium uh, labels some slip insert is uh, in the meantime it's a very good solution thank you so the, those narrow bands yeah actually are, 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 come away, they're, they're higher yeah. than, the, than the painting, so painting. that's what protects them when they're yes, close together. Yes, give us some uh, micro space mm. between them. Right, thank you. 
And so next one for Diego, can you say a bit more about the natural dyes used on the textiles? Yeah, uh, so the, the, uh, as I said, they were, they were, they were found on, on the first um, painting mostly because that, that was an 18th century paintings. We were expecting natural dyes and uh, it, we found indigo, we found uh, safflower, and then we found this mixture of sapan wood and the Chinese cork tree. So, yeah, I can say a few words. So we, with the indigo, for example, it's, um, it, it's a tricky one because we can, we can say it's indigo, but indigo is actually extracted from um, a lot of plants. Uh, that in different part they have been um, they, they grow in different parts of the world so each each region if you want has its own uh, indigo plant but unfortunately there are there are no uh, straightforward scientific methods that can distinguish the type of the plant and this is because in the end the indigo that is ex that is produced still contains indigotin and indirubin which are those two molecules and and that's everything you see. Uh, so it would require a different uh, approach to, to the analysis to exactly. So I cannot say if the indigo that is 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 a Korean indigo, for example, if it's if it's the indigo, the actual Indian indigo, if it's wood, mm -hmm. if it if it comes from 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 which plant it comes from. Um, the safflower has been has been used uh, in Asia and in East Asia for for a long time. It has been. It has had royal connotation in China at some point, so it's a, we know that it's a, there is a long-lasting tradition of dying with, with, with safflower. In this case, what, what struck me about it was that it's a, it's a very, very deep uh, red, very bright red, whereas safflower is a very light-sensitive dye. It tends to fade uh, quite easily. In general, the dyes on the on on the um, on that painting was quite well preserved, I must say. But to to reach that bright shade of red, it has definitely taken a, um, a lot of mastery of of the safflower in safflower dyeing. Uh, that, that's because safflower contains both yellow and red molecules, and you have to get rid of the yellow before and to, to, to have a pure red. And this pure red is very, very difficult to obtain. You usually have this orangey, pinkish shade that are more typical of the safflower dye. But it was a, this, this was really a, 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 a very rare example of a very pure red. And with the mixture of sapan wood and Chinese cork tree, it's it's another quite, um, I would say, ex well, not expected, but a common combination to obtain orange shades. Um, the Chinese cork tree, again, is a very traditional dye. Um, mostly associated with China, but I think Mijong was saying yesterday that, of course, I mean, the exchange in materials in East Asia has, you know, millennia of, of history, so I wasn't, su I wasn't surprised to, to see, of course, uh, a very typical Chinese dye there. But, for example, it could have been distinguished from the Japanese version, so there is, there is uh, the Amur cork tree, which is the equivalent dye in Japan, and they do, ha they do have a slightly different chemical composition, so that the chemical detail allowed us to say that this was, this was the Chinese and not the Japanese. So, yeah, yes, a little bit more to the story. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. So, a question for you, Meijun. Um, your very wonderful diagram that you showed this afternoon of a Korean folding screen format shows it as being a single papering layer before hinging. Um, do Korean screens use fewer layers than Japanese screens? Uh, for example, this diagram that I developed in the base of the archive, uh, Royal Archives, dating uh, seven. 1744. Mm -hmm. So in this archive, I discovered all the terminology, and then I reconstitute its orders, uh, the uh, process, mounting process, because I know is uh, how we can I can make folding screen with my knowledge of folding screen making, and there's all the information from the 
uh, archive information, I combined and then I developed this uh, diagram. So in traditionally, in my uh, archives mentioned how many different uh, the material they don't say. Just uh, mentioned uh, some list of the material. Mm -hmm. And then when I discovered uh, during the, this uh, mounting, I found some layer. In the case of the uh, 12 panels uh, screen, I found the two layer, the under papering. And when I conserved the small, the sense of life, this one also uh, extremely late, 19th or 20, beginning of the 20th century, the folding screen, I found two layer. But uh, sometimes we can find three layer. It depends on the thickness of the paper also to compensate so that they can apply the more, but not more than this one. And as uh, we know, sitabari, Japanese uh, inner structure is uh, on pap uh, paper. We can say this sitabari. This kind of structure, is, uh, even in Japan, is uh, quite late to the Soa or 18th century, they start. This kind of structure is, so it's quite late. But before, we don't know. But the Korean one, we can't find all different uh, step of the under favorings method, like uh, Japanese method. But at least we can find something is a uh, uh, joining the method is a similar than Japanese one to avoid uh, some tensions uh, between the uh, for, uh, inner frame and painting itself. Thank you. So this one is, is purposefully for both of you. Have you got any comments on the water fugitivity of synthetic dyes? So how, how, the, how water might affect those synthetic dyes? It appears from Mei Zhang's talk that synthetic pigments were more likely to bleed in the presence of water. So they were more likely to, to move away from the fabrics. Is that what you found? I would, uh, I would say that the the main example I would say, I don't know if that in, if that in, induced by humidity, but I would say that it might have played a role. You could see in one of the images in my presentation that there was an imprint mm -hmm. of the purple damask uh, on, on the blue um, textile underneath. So I, I, th that's definitely a transfer of, of, of the dye. And I think that humidity could, could be a main you know, a major, a major factor there for, for, for the transfer. Uh, when they were synthesized, these colors, the synthetic dyes, they, they were, of before, the ones that made it to the market were supposed to be the ones that were, you know, the most wash fast, light fast, and so forth. In terms of light fastness, I think it's clear now that they, they, they you know, they had a certain stability, but of course they were not meant to last the, the wash fastness, though, is something I guess that can be checked more in the immediate because, you know, it's, mm. it's, it's it, it, yeah, if you wash it once or twice and it keeps bleeding, you, you, you can tell that that's... So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that there is a huge, huge um, risk of, you know, re really, really bleeding, but it's, it's true that there are several examples that if, if there is contact between two areas that are dyed, the other thing I'm, I'm not sure about is whether this can be restricted to the synthetic dyes or if it's actually, you know, something that happens with the natural dyes as well. Although, mm -hmm. as I said, the mordantine, all the mordantine process related to, to the natural dyes were also made in order to fix them better. So some of these dyes did not require mordantine, so it might have made, made them more, more movable, but yeah, we, I, I didn't look specifically into this. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you did any, any specific tests during the... The test, I, I agree with you, is uh, this problem, it's not uh, just uh, the synthetic uh, dye or natural dye. I think it depends, mm. completely it depends. And especially uh, the synthetic dyes are used to use. Uh, end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, it's uh, quite unstable. <laughs> so it can cause us many problems. Mm -hmm. So in this moment, so we should uh, give us a more uh, careful the approach 
this is very important. Even the natural dyes, uh, some fabric also can cause the same problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when I dyed with a dyer in Korea, we, I request to her is a very, very strongly. For me, it's even to spend more time, I prepare some result, it's much more safe. So in this case, she developed her idea uh, and her experience. We washed more. Okay. Yeah, I was very <laughs> Probably and curious yeah. about your yeah. experience with the dyers. So yeah. point of view as a conservator or scientist and the dyer herself, experience is really interesting if we can exchange, uh, we can develop the, the much more safe approach for conservation treatment. And then I think that this information, soon as she will write in a, a kind of the essay for mm -hmm. our uh, final report. <laughs> Thank you. So we have a, a question. Um, is this Korean screen mount, mounted as a 12 panel? And how do you compare the Japanese panels as a pair of six? So it's similar to a question we had yesterday um, yeah. about the scale of these of these yes. big Korean panels. <coughs> I'm not a specialist <laughs> for uh, Japanese uh, painting conservation, but uh, from the, my experience in the Hirama studio, most of the Japanese uh, the screen, the 12, 12 panels, uh, uh, divide uh, six, six panels, a pair of the six Panel is a, a kind of the continuity, the view, panoramic, travel panel. But the Korean one, as you can see, this uh, painting specifically, is a travel panel is a really is a several things. But in this case, each panel, the proportion is a change, much narrow, the width, and uh, looks like a much extended, mm -hmm. vertically, is a rectangle shape. So it's a limited space architecture in Korea to install, probably is uh, the, the best solution at the moment. In comparison with the Japanese one, Japanese one, I think uh, each panel's proportion is much more wider than this one, I think. Interesting, thank you. So, um, a question from Cecile Mir, which refers to your speak, talk yesterday, Mejo. Did the 20th century painting with the stain from the wooden lattice that you showed yesterday, the one that required bleaching, mm -hmm. have several layers of paper between the painting and the wood? Or did the stain from the wood occur because the painting was directly mounted against the wood? Um, that this painting is uh, quite uh, the contemporary or uh, work, we can say. But in this case also, we can find another uh, damage problem because it depends on the quality the wood they used to use. When I uh, discussed with uh, Mr. Cha, he said it's not a problem the wood, the degree the dry the wood. It's if a dry, uh, wood is not completely dried, some gas off mm -hmm. can cause this kind of the problem. So finally we made the decision, we used this uh, same frame with uh, some protection, it's uh, uh, the wood part is uh, covered with a medium standard, it's uh, some other uh, paper. So there wasn't a protective layer before, but now yeah. there is. Because if, if we use a new one, can cause again the mm -hmm. same problem because it's not completely dried. Yeah. This one at least dried more than new one. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so another one from Mejung. Uh, what repair silk did you use and how, where and how did you obtain it? Okay, the repair silk, it was a very tricky question. Uh, fortunately, so for this, uh, the 12 panels, you can see it's uh, quite narrow. It's not the typical painting uh, silk, this one. Uh, we can say this kind of the very uh, narrow strip the one is we used to use in daily life in Korea. So we can find the seal if someone is uh, making mm -hmm. this uh, kind of the silk. But it's a for conservation point of view, if I use a new one, it's uh, uh, physically too much stronger than original painting. So I approach antique silk. 
this kind of thing, especially we should order and uh, uh, approach some uh, seller. Mm -hmm. So I bought in Korea and this, so it's quite expensive, but so we can't find always this one. Is uh, when I go to Korea three times, first time I could bought more, but the last time almost nothing. Mm, <laughs> so the supply of antique silk in Korea yeah, is also yeah. beginning to become difficult. For example, this kind of the, in the past, I don't know exactly, is uh, or 50 years ago, 70 years ago, the someone is a weave, just to keep in the, there's a water up, mm. long time, and then someday we should, uh, the reserved, so in this one that they sell. Mm. So this kind of, the, uh, we collect some paper and they start to sell. So I uh, bought this kind of things. The problem is even I can bought random C <laughs> in Korea in the market. The problem is that it should be exactly a similar it's a width method mm. and the density mm. with um, our painting. Mm. So it's the maximum buy and then select this, something is a similar one. Mm. I reserved like this. Thank you. And another thing probably I should uh, use is that some um, quite the visible the missing area, I use this uh, kind of the silk. But the really tiny one, I use the really open Chinese uh, silk. This one is a, thanks to Mrs. Chu, that I could use. It was very useful. Thank you, Chirashu. <laughs> Brilliant. And then sort of a similar question about paper this time. Um, how, how did you come about using the Schwann paper and what thickness and size did you use for the lining and how did you apply it? Oh, lining is a... Schwann paper is a, not specifically is a thickness. Uh, it depends on the, the uh, need. For example, it's a thick one, thin one. So when we compare it with another pieces, to give us some balance, physical balance, we can add or we can reduce. Mm. So it's not specific one layer. I can mention, that for example, first lining, I use a Chinese uh, chum paper. This one and the second one in uh, Korean paper, mulberry paper, hanji. This one is a, should be a very good balance with uh, mountain silk, mm -hmm. the lined pieces. If it's, uh, everything is uh, good, it's very, um, it's okay. So it's a thickness is not really important in this case. But in the case of the for hanging scroll, as I said, uh, when we make a folding screen, we will stretch anyways all pieces on the frame, much more safe physically. But if we make a hanging scroll, it's a much more complicated good balance, everything in this moment. If you think one layer or a little bit of the thickness is not enough or strength is not enough, flexibility is too much, in this moment we can add it a, a very thin, uh, one more layer of Chinese sham paper. Thank you. And for you, Diego, would you be able to develop on the process to make the Fuxin you mentioned in your talk. So can yeah. you talk a little bit about process? Yeah, it's, um, I think the, the, yeah, this can add a little bit also to what, what I said um, about Jennifer's question about, you know, dating. And so it's the, the, another nice thing about going down to the molecular level, the way we do with, with HPLCMS is that there are cases in which you can really pin down the synthetic pathway that was used to create the synthetic dye because those evolved as well. So the same molecule, in this case fuchsin, uh, in, the 18, in, the, in the 1850s and 60s was produced using a precise synthetic pathway that I don't remember exactly, but the result of it was that they were trying to uh, synthesize a single molecule, but they actually uh, obtained some byproducts and stuff during the synthesis. And so uh, you obtain a mixture of four molecules, which are all very similar, but in the chromatogram they show as four single peaks and they have a characteristic bell shape. So when, when you get that, it's, it's quite indicative of uh, an early process um, 
produ produced uh, Fuxin. In the 1890s, if I remember correctly, they, th there, there was another uh, synthetic process that took, uh, took over, and that, uh, again, I don't remember the details, but uh, the, um, the relative amounts of the Fuxin molecules changes, and you do not see this bell shape anymore, but you, you see them in a different distribution, and if I remember co correctly, there is a, a, one of those four is missing at that point. Mm -hmm. It doesn't synthesize anymore. So this is a, a lot of detail, but just to say that even within the same synthetic dye, you can also pin down whether it was produced in a certain mm -hmm. amount of time. So the fuchsin that we saw was actually produced pre-1890s for sure, because we know the discovery date, it, it restricts the window in which it would have been applied. So yeah, it happens with, with some other dyes as well. Although, yeah, it, it goes down to a lot of detail and a lot of, but yeah, yeah. Thank you. And um, I think this is going to be our last question of the afternoon, and um, it's actually for you both, I feel. Um, are you aware of any research done on reconciling the textiles used for mountings to historic clothes and costumes? So where things may have been clothing before, has there been any research, how much research do you all know of about where the clothing was and how it moved into screens? Yeah, yeah so I'm not, I'm not aware of any, but I, I think it's a, it's a nice point because Mijong was saying yesterday that this, the silk was not specifically made for, for mounting the painting, so it was actually made for, for clothing, and, and so I think it would be a nice, uh, a very nice research area to, to see if by researching the patterns and mm -hmm. researching collections first, of course, if there is some you know, historic uh, periods that we could focus on and see if we can, yeah, as, as, as the question, reconcile some of yeah. the silk on the paintings yeah. with some costumes or... But, yeah, I'm not aware of, of research done. I think I've... I think Bo Yung Lee has done some research, for example, on um, book covers, if mm -hmm. I remember correctly, which were also, like, some books that were covered in, in silk damasks. And, and I think she, she, she could, she could um, recognize some of the patterns uh, for sure and also some of the silk being very similar between some of the book covers and, and some paintings that she, she has seen. But um, yeah, yeah so nothing I else comes to my mind. Very, as you mentioned very well, is that the, the, this kind of the research, for example, the uh, dictation all products that the silk we don't know exactly similar pattern very good design symbol is that we used to use uh, for clothes because uh, in asia especially korea I, I think the color or pattern it's not aesthetic point of view m much more uh, symbolic mm -hmm. if we give it some symbol they use <laughs> Even say the uh, leather color, for example, it's not really good for me. But it's the leather color, the symbol is a very positive. We we use, and there's some pattern also the same. So the most of the pattern that we used to use are for, especially for mount, very uh, good symbol and uh, beautiful uh, uh, sign. I think in this moment, but we don't have the many information about the historic mount. The, in the case of the Boyang's study, for example, this kind of the Joseon annual's uh, the mm, documents mm, yes, is uh, so. regularly is a government uh, uh, published. We can say yeah. published, the, so we can see exactly the date. Mm. So we can uh, identify this kind of similar pattern or similar weaving method. Yeah. This uh, this area is a very good. Uh, reference mm -hmm. the, for the identified the production date, I think. It's very good. And then so another thing is that the, if we, the conservation, especially this painting conservation the field, that we don't develop this kind of research until now. Is that, as I said, I studied uh, basically the Western pain, 
in uh, papers conservation uh, method, the Western way. I want to try the, some connection between the, another area. Because uh, before I thought that scientists work always <laughs> Mm -hmm. Scientist point of view, <laughs> conservators just a concentrate conservation. We couldn't cr create some connection co closely. It's, uh, even so, we are working in the same area, and it's the same moment as uh, artisan also. Their point of view also is a really interesting. I think to yeah. develop the, our idea. It's a very important point, and I think we, we again we are in a lucky place here at the British Museum mm -hmm. where. This, this sort of collaboration between departments is encouraged and we, we have a lot of occasions where we can talk and discuss and, and bring the language also on, 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 on mm -hmm. comprehens comprehensible level for, for each of us. It, it is true that there are challenges sometimes, but it's, it's, it's a very good point and I think it should be expanded even further because I think you know with textiles there is also a, a, a social sciences aspect, mm -hmm. a, a social studies like the evolution of fashion with, with, with patterns and, and, and some, some things that were more in taste during a certain period and then it changed. I think this could also add a lot to the narrative because I think ultimately what we want to say is, is a little bit mm -hmm. of the story of the people that were behind these, these mm -hmm. paintings, not only just in form on the technical and, and the, and, and which is of course the, the, ground, the ground work that has to be done, but then you know, there, there were people behind these mm -hmm. this, this paintings, behind the, behind these this, this textiles, and, and so I think that's also something that we should put a little bit more effort in and, and, and bring to surface. I think that, 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 that would be a nice next. Yes, nice next but, but <laughs> yeah. Thank you both very much. Turn around. So, my thanks to our speakers today, Mejun Kim Marande and Diego Tamburini, and also to Sangha Kim for yes, her, her presentation yesterday. My special thanks to our audience. Thank you so much for all the wonderful questions you've sent in. And a big thank you to our brilliant AV team who have supported us throughout. And my team of um, question handlers, uh, Matthias Sotras and Joanna Koshek, really much appreciated all their work this, uh, the last two afternoons. So, to conclude this event, our most sincere thanks to our generous funders, the Amore Pacific Corporation, and our partners, the Career Foundation and the Amore Pacific Museum. And to all the partners and contributors towards this project, we thank you and we hope you have a lovely afternoon. <laughs>